Good evening. Thank you. Please be seated. It's a joy to introduce tonight's lecturer. Father Edmund Waldstein is monk of the Cistercian Order at Heiligenkreuz Abbey in Austria. He's also a lecturer at the Pope Benedict XVI Philosophical Theological University at Heiligenkreuz. His doctorate is in theology from the University of Vienna with the dissertation on the double bind of loneliness, David Foster Wallace from the perspective of theological ethics. He earned his bachelor's degree from Thomas Aquinas College, known to many of us for the kinship of its program of instruction to the program here at St. John's. He's recently co-authored with Peter Krasniewski, a book entitled Integralism and the Common Good. The collection of essays seeks to investigate the human good and the common good in the context of the good simply, in ways that challenges uh, our assumptions in liberal society. Tonight's lecture is entitled Universal Predicates and Universal Causes. Please join me in welcoming Potter Edmund Falkman. Thank you very much. I've long admired St. John's College from a distance. And so it's truly an honor and a joy for me to lecture here. And these past two days, I've had the privilege of sitting in on some classes, which has been a wonderful experience. St. John's has always been an object of fascination to graduates of other great books, colleges, um, including my own alma mater, Thomas Aquinas College, as you mentioned. Our curriculum at Thomas Aquinas College is copied from St. John's. In fact, we even use some of the old lab and music manuals from St. John's, uh, spiral-bound uh, photocopied manuals. We used to say at TAC, I go to TAC, we use the great manuals program. Um, <laughs> But far more than the great manuals, what St. John's has modeled for other great books, colleges, is the Socratic desire for wisdom and the Socratic attempt to seek for wisdom through conversation or dialectic. Dialogu, through speech. Certainly there are different modes uh, in which this search can be carried on. Both Plato's dialogues and Aristotle's treatises can be seen as carrying on the Socratic search for wisdom in different ways. If St. John's is associated with a mode like that of the Platonic dialogues that use questioning and aporia and irony to desedimentize the cliches of our language, Thomas Aquinas College is associated more with a mode like that of the Aristotelian treatises, with their patient attention to common conceptions and their painstaking, almost pedantic, syllogistic unfolding of what is implicit in such conceptions. St. John's is, as uh, your very own Eva Brand has pointed out, radically non-dogmatic. It embodies no teaching of substance, she writes in a, a, a review, but only pedagogic hypotheses, which though they undeniably and I think unavoidably embody what might be called biases of attention, nevertheless deliver no dogma of any sort concerning the chosen learning matter. Thomas Aquinas College, on the other hand, is intentionally dogmatic uh, in a double sense, both in the sense of taking a definite position on certain fundamental questions that are raised uh, by the great books, and in the sense of accepting divine revelation, and therefore of uniting the pursuit of human wisdom in philosophy to the pursuit of divine wisdom in theology. 
But today I don't want to focus on the difference, uh, but I want to reflect a little bit on what exactly it is that we seek when we seek wisdom through speech. In the Platonic Dialogues, the search is often described as beginning with a question about what something is. What is virtue? What is justice? The question is answered by seeing that the thing in question belongs to a more universal kind. But the more universal kind is itself comprehended by an even more universal kind. Thus, the path of philosophy is a path that ascends towards ever greater universality. Wisdom would seem to consist in finding the most universal of all kinds or forms. In a lecture uh, delivered, I think, here at St. John's College by Jacob Klein, Klein describes this path as follows. And this is uh, the first quote on the little handout that you may or may not have received. Yes, I, I can hear the rustling of the handouts. Um, in order to grasp what something is, we have to allocate it to a family of things quasi known to us, and then to allocate this family of things, this genus, to another larger family also quasi known to us, and to keep on ascending. Only when and if the last step has been made can we say that we have found out what the unknown thing, that X, which started us off on this journey is? Can we say that we know what it is? It is this last step that illuminates sun-like, not only all the intermediate genera, but the very thing, the what of which we wanted to know. The expression sun-like that Klein used in that passage is clearly a reference to book seven of Plato's Republic, which the freshmen will be discussing on Monday. Maybe they've already taken a peek, who knows. Um, it is the famous allegory of the cave. In the allegory, Socrates describes someone emerging from a cave where he and others have been imprisoned, seeing only shadows of statues projected by the light of a fire onto a screen. Emerging from the cave, this person sees the sun. The sun stands for the idea or form of the good, agathu idea, which provides truth and intelligence in the intelligible realm. Already in book six, Socrates has argued that the form of the good is both a universal idea after which other things are called good and at the same time a universal cause. The first point that it's a universal idea has to do with the fact that the word good is said of, predicated of, many things. And this is the second quote. We both assert that there are, and distinguish in speech, many fair things, many good things, and so on for each kind of thing. And we also assert that there is a fair itself, a good itself, and so on for all the things that we then set down as many. Now again, we refer them to one idea of each, as though the idea were one, and we address it as that which really is. And moreover, we say that the former are seen, but not intellected, while the ideas are intellected, but not seen. In other words, the good is a universal predicate. It's said of all good things. Moreover, this universal predicate, this idea or form, is more real than the things of which it is said. The good itself is more real than the good things. The second point that Socrates argues in book six is that this form of the good is not only a predicate said of many, but also a cause. 
It is a cause of our knowing intelligible things, just as the sun is the cause of our seeing visible things. Quote three. What provides the truth to the things known and gives the power to the one who knows is the idea of the good. And as the cause of the knowledge and truth, you can understand it to be a thing known. But as fair as these two are, knowledge and truth, if you believe that it is something different from them and still fairer than they, your belief will be right. But this idea or form is not only the cause of understanding, but it is also the cause of being, just as the sun causes the generation of living things. Next quote, I suppose you'll say the sun not only provides what is seen with the power of being seen, but also with generation, growth, and nourishment, although it itself isn't generation. Therefore, say that not only being known is present in the things known as a consequence of the good, but also existence and being are in them besides as a result of it. Although the good isn't being, but is still beyond being, exceeding it in dignity and power. So the universal cause of intelligibility, of understandability, is also the universal cause of being. And as Klein notes in the lecture I already quoted, it must be something that does not lack anything that is self-sufficient, complete, and perfect. Glaucon calls it um, a mechanon kalos, overwhelming beauty or unmanageable beauty. We could translate a mechanon. And the philosopher searches with passionate desire for the knowledge of this beautiful form. But here a difficulty arises. Is it true that what is most universal is also what is most causal, most perfect, and most illuminating? Could one not say, on the contrary, that the most universal is what is most abstract and therefore least powerful, most vague, imprecise, imperfect. If we see a figure approaching in the dark and you ask me, what is that? And I say, it is a being. I have named it by something very universal. But this very universality under which I have comprehended it means that I have said very little of interest about the thing in question. Of course it is a being. But what kind of being? Is it alive? Is it safe? Is it a human being? Or a bear? Or a gorilla? Or a vampire? I have said nothing about what really interests you about the figure approaching. A somewhat similar objection was raised by the German sociologist Max Weber in a famous lecture that he delivered in 1917 entitled Science as a Vocation. In that lecture, Weber summarizes the allegory of the cave. Somewhat wrong, he gets the details wrong. But, <laughs> but then um, he interprets it as an allegory of the discovery of the scientific concept, Begriff, in German, which seemingly enables us to grasp eternal truths. And here's the next quote, which is from Weber. Plato's passionate enthusiasm in the Republic is ultimately to be explained by the fact that for the first time, the meaning of the concept had been consciously discovered. One of the greatest tools of all scientific knowledge it was Socrates who discovered its implications. He was not alone in this respect. You can find very similar approaches in India to the kind of logic developed by Aristotle. But nowhere was its significance demonstrated with this degree of consciousness. In Greece, for the first time, there appeared a tool with which you could clamp someone into a logical vice 
so that he could not escape without admitting either that he knew nothing or that this and nothing else was the, was the truth, the eternal truth that would never fade like the actions of the blind men in the cave. And then Weber dismisses this whole idea. Next quote. Well, who regards science in this light today? Nowadays, the general feeling, particularly among young people, is the opposite, if anything. The ideas of science appear to be an otherworldly realm of artificial abstractions that strive to capture the blood and sap of real life in their scrawny hands without ever managing to do so. Here in life, however, in what Plato calls the shadow theater on the walls of the cave, we feel the pulse of authentic reality. In science, we have derivative, lifeless, will-o'-the-wisps and nothing else. So far, Weber. And it's clear as the lecture goes on that he's not just summarizing the opinions of young people or whatever that he doesn't agree with, but he thinks that really the uh, description of science or philosophy in the Republic is, a, is an illusion that has been shattered, and no one can believe this today. Is Weber right? Is the ascent to the most universal form nothing more than the thinking of an empty abstraction? Was Socrates on the wrong path? I want to propose that a helpful distinction for thinking about these questions is a distinction between two kinds of universal. Universal predicates and universal causes. As we saw, uh, Plato's Socrates presents these two kinds of universal as coinciding. The most universal predicate is also the most universal cause. But Aristotle tends to keep these two apart. And St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, my favorite, uh, <laughs> 13th century theologian and commentator on Aristotle, he points this out in considering an apparent tension between two texts of Aristotle. Uh, let's look at each of these texts briefly in turn before considering the distinction that Thomas then invokes to resolve the apparent tension. The first text, this is the seventh quote, is from the beginning of the physics, Aristotle's great work on nature. The natural path is to go from the things that are more known and certain to us toward things which are more certain and more knowable by nature. For the more known to us and the simply knowable are not the same. Whence it is necessary to proceed in this way from what is less certain by nature but more certain to us toward what is more certain and more knowable by nature. Now the things which are first obvious and certain to us are rather confused. And from these, the elements and principles become known later by dividing them. Whence it is necessary to go from the universal to the particulars. For the whole is more known according to sensation, and the universal is a certain whole for the universal embraces many things within it as parts. So when we sense something, uh, say you're tasting a glass of wine, you first have kind of a general impression of the taste, but then if you savor it in your mouth, you can begin to distinguish different flavors, different notes or whatever. If you're, if you're a wine snob, at least you're going to tell us about the pepper and chocolate you taste in this wine. Um, so the, by confused, Aristotle doesn't mean a confusion in the sense of a mistake. It's not that you drink the wine and you think it's milk. But confused in the sense that the many parts of the flavor are all fused together into a whole. In a similar way, Aristotle is claiming we know things first in a universal but vague way. 
And then we have to tease out what is latent in that confused knowledge. So Aristotle in this text seems to be supporting the objection uh, against philosophy as the path towards universality that I brought up. It seems that for him at least, in natural philosophy, the path is not to ascend to the more universal, but to descend to the more particular. But there's another text by Aristotle. Next quote. This is from the Metaphysics, and Aristotle is discussing the characteristics of the wise man. One of these characteristics is that the wise man is held to be someone who knows everything. And this is what Aristotle says about that. The knowing of all things must belong to the one who has most of all the universal knowledge, since he knows in a certain way all the things that come under it. And these are just about the most difficult things for human beings to know, those that are most universal, since they are farthest away from the senses. There seems to be a tension between these two passages of Aristotle. In the first, Aristotle is claiming that the more universal is more known to us, easier for us to know. In the second, he is saying that the universal is less known to us, more difficult for us to know. In commenting on this apparent contradiction in the next quote on the handout, St. Thomas Aquinas draws a distinction between universal predicates and universal causes. Those things which are more universal according to simple apprehension are known first. For being is the first thing that comes into the intellect, as Avicenna says. An animal comes into the intellect before man does. For just as in the order of nature, which proceeds from potentiality to actuality, animal is prior to man, so too in the genesis of knowledge, the intellect conceives animal before it conceives man. But with respect to the investigations of natural properties and causes, less universal things are known first, because we discover universal causes by means of the particular causes which belong to one genus or species. Now those things which are universal in causing are known subsequently by us, notwithstanding the fact that they are things which are primarily knowable according to their nature. Although things which are universal by predication are known to us in some way before the less universal, notwithstanding the fact that they are not known prior to singular things. So there are two kinds of universal. You have these universal causes and universal predicates. And the universal causes are very difficult to know. And they are the last thing you know, as it were, after you know everything else. But the universal predicates are easy to know, and they're the first thing that enters your mind when you a little bit of intellectual light comes into it. Okay, I want to talk about each of these now a little bit in turn. And first about universal predicates. Universal predicates are names that are said of many different things which have something in common. For example, the name animal is said of tigers, lions, horses, and so on, on account of something that is common to all of them. Tiger is said of many individual tigers on account of some common nature which all tigers share. Little children quickly learn to recognize tigers and images of tigers. Tiger! Right? And to distinguish them from all other things. This is kind of amazing. It's as though uh, the common form or nature of tigers expressed in their appearance is recognized by the children. It can seem almost as though a child has already seen the form of a tiger in a previous life and is now remembering it. Fourth, 
for the Socratic tradition, that is for both Plato and for Aristotle and for their many followers, such universal predicates are not mere words that we apply to classes of things that happen to appear similar to us. Rather, they grasp something true about reality, a true common nature or essence that is among or over the many things. But there are two different ways in which the followers of Socrates accounted for such universals. Recall that in Republic 6, Socrates argues that the predication of the common name good to many things implies the existence of one true idea or form of the good. And he makes a similar argument in Republic 10, using different examples to show that whenever one name is said of many, there is one true form above the many. The many are mere imitations. The one idea or form is the true being. Here's a quote that's not on your handout, but I'll read it out for you. Then let's now set down any one of the many's you please. For example, if you wish, there are surely many couches and tables. But as for ideas for these furnishings, there are presumably two, one of couch, one of table. Aren't we also accustomed to say that it is in looking to the idea of each implement that one craftsman makes the couches and another the chairs we use, and similarly for other things? For presumably none of the craftsmen fabricates the idea itself. How could he? And what about the couch maker? Weren't you just saying that he doesn't make the form, which is what we, of course, say is just a couch, but a, is not just a, the couch, but a certain couch? Then if he doesn't make what is, he wouldn't make the being, but something that is like the being, but is not being. And if someone were to assert that the work of the producer of couches or of any other manual artisan is complete being, he would run the risk of saying what is not true. The true couch, the form or idea of a couch which has not been made by human hands, is separated from matter and motion, from the flux of becoming in this sensible world. The particular couches made by craftsmen are mere images and not true being. As always in Plato, it's unclear to what extent he wants us to accept the conclusion of this argument as simply true. Aristotle, at any rate, um, does not think that this view is really the view of, of Socrates. He thinks that this is sort of a Platonic uh, corruption of the Socratic doctrine. Um, he says, uh, yeah, here's another quote not on the handout. The opinion about the forms came to those who spoke about them as a result of being persuaded by the Heracleitian writings that it is true that all perceptible things are always in flux, so that if knowledge and thought are to be about anything, there must be besides the perceptible things some other enduring natures since there can be no knowledge of things in flux. And then Socrates made it his business to be concerned with the moral virtues, an account of them he first sought to define things in a universal way. But Socrates did not make the universals or the definitions separate, while those who came next did, and called beings of this sort forms, so for them, it followed by pretty much the same argument that there are forms of all things that are spoken of in a universal way. And Aristotle thinks this idea of those who came next is wrong. Um, and he gives many arguments in his metaphysics for why we should reject it. Um, many of these reasons were of of course, already anticipated by Plato himself in the Parmenides, above all. We get these arguments against the forms. Um, but I want to point to just one of these. This is quote 10 on the handout. Uh, 
But according to the necessities of the case and the opinions about the forms, if they can be shared in, there must be ideas of substances only, for they are not shared in incidentally, but each form must be shared in as something not predicated of a subject. I take Aristotle to be building here on insights that he explains in his works on logic. Primary substances, that is, things which exist in their own right, are neither present in some other subject, as the color is present in this table, for example, but nor are they said of, predicated of, a subject. For example, Socrates is not in another subject, the way his color is in him, but nor is Socrates predicated of anything else. We do not say, man is Socrates, nor do we say, six feet tall is Socrates, nor do we say, Xantippe is Socrates. But Aristotle seems to be arguing the forms are kind of contradictory because on the one hand, they seem to be primary substances. They're things in their own right, not present in other things, but also they're said of other things. For example, we say Socrates is a man. So the form man is said of Socrates. And Aristotle says, well, he seems to be arguing that this isn't really the way um, speech works. A thing that exists for itself isn't really said of something else. Now Aristotle takes a different route in explaining universal predicates. For him, what is going on in a universal predication is that our minds are abstracting the common nature from the many things among which it exists. In reality, the common nature exists within the natural things. But our minds can receive something of it without receiving everything. This is why we can have the idea of a material being, say a tiger, in our minds in an immaterial way. The universal predicate tiger, which we say of all individual tigers, is immaterial only because our minds have taken the intelligible form of tiger without the matter of individual tigers. This immaterial form exists in our mind as an intention, that is, as something that intends, that points towards the concrete beings from which it is abstracted. There is no immaterial form of tigers above the many tigers. Rather, there is only the one form of tiger in the many material tigers. So that's universal predicates. What about universal causes now? What is meant by a universal cause, what St. Thomas means in his commentary on Aristotle's metaphysics, is not just a cause that has many effects that are, as it were, on the same level of being as it. For example, one parent can have many children. One cause, many effects, but that's not yet a universal cause because the children are on the same level as the parents. Well, <laughs> at least in terms of having the same nature. But rather, what is meant by universal cause is the cause that has many effects while it is on a higher level than those effects, on a higher level of being. The scholastics call this an equivocal cause because it has a different nature from its effects, whereas a cause on the same level of being they call a univocal cause because it has the same nature as its effects. Why might one think that such causes exist? Ronald MacArthur, um, who was the founding president of Thomas Aquinas College, he wrote a paper on universal causes and universal predicates. Um, and he offers the following uh, argument, which is quote 11. It is manifest by induction that Socrates comes to be and that he is generated by his mother. His existence is necessarily dependent upon hers in such a way that if she had not been, he would not now be. 
A question, however, remains. Socrates' mother causes an effect similar to herself, for Socrates is an individual with the same nature as she. Since the mother was also generated and at one time was not, and since human nature is found in her, it follows that she is not the cause of that nature, either in herself or in Socrates. If she were the sole causal explanation of the nature of Socrates, she would, since she also has that nature, have to be the cause of herself. It is the same with all univocal causality. No univocal cause can be the cause of the nature of the species in which it participates. The mother is the cause only of the existence of human nature in Socrates. She is not the cause of the form, but of the informed composite, since it is the composite which is generated. It is necessary, therefore, if we wish to explain the nature as such, to seek a cause which transcends both son and mother. Thus, Ronald MacArthur. A typical example of the Thomas Aquinas College style, which I was mentioning before. Slightly, yeah. Um, but note the similarity of this argument to uh, Socrates' arguments in the Republic, um, both in Republic 6 about the good and in Republic 10 about the couch maker and the couch. Just as the couch maker does not make the idea of the couch, so the mother of a human being does not generate human nature. But the conclusion is slightly different. Instead of concluding to a separate form, the man itself, MacArthur concludes to a higher kind of cause, a cause of human nature as such, which, is, which however cannot be called human. This is what is meant by a universal cause. This is a different kind of universal than a universal form. This kind of universal is not said of particular things. We do not say this man is the universal cause of human nature. Nor is this kind of universal of the same nature as the particular effects that it causes. It must in some way contain the being that it gives to, effect, to its effects, since you cannot give what you do not have, but it contains that being in a higher way than the effects contain them. Just as a couch maker must in some way already have the form of couch contained in the power of the art that is in his soul, if he is to cause it in material out of which he makes a couch, so the universal cause must have all the being, all the perfections that it causes, but in a higher way. And MacArthur goes on to show many differences between these two kinds of universal. For example, while a universal predicate is vague and confused compared to the specificity of particulars, the universal cause has the being that it gives to particulars in a more intense way than those particulars themselves. The universal cause causes not just general features of its effects, but the whole particular effect in its ultimate specificity. As I noted earlier, Aristotle holds that the wise man has the most universal knowledge. In his commentary on the metaphysics, St. Thomas Aquinas argues that this should not be taken to mean only that the wise man knows universal predicates, so that he can say, for example, being is, and he said something true about everything. Wow, I know everything. Being is. <laughs> Not enough. Um, but more importantly, that he knows universal causes. And this fits with the rest of Aristotle's discussion of the wise man in Metaphysics 1, Chapter 2. He argues that the wise man not only knows all things and the most difficult things, but also that he has the most precise knowledge that he is most able to teach, and that he knows what is worth knowing for its own sake, rather than for something else. Therefore, Aristotle concludes, what the wise man knows 
are first principles or causes of things, including that cause which is their last end or purpose. Quote now from uh, Metaphysics um, 1, 2. This is not on your handout. So from all the things that have been said, the name, namely wisdom, falls to the same kind of knowledge, for it must be a contemplation of the first sources and causes, since also the good, or that for the sake of which, is one of the causes. Later on in the metaphysics, it will become clear that these first causes have the features that I have associated with universal causes. Hence, St. Thomas Aquinas was able to read the feature of knowing the universal that Aristotle ascribes to the wise man as referring not to knowing universal predicates only, but to knowing universal causes. In Metaphysics 12, Aristotle approaches the first causes by an analysis of causes of motion and change, of what we can call agent causes. And don't worry, I'm not going to follow him through all the steps of that argument. But I do want to point out that at the end of that argument, he changes over to talking about a different kind of cause, namely the good or the final cause. To understand this shift, it is useful to recall uh, Aristotle's famous distinction between four kinds of causes in the physics. There he distinguishes the material out of which something is made as a cause of the thing, the form that makes the material to be a definite thing, the agent or mover which puts the form into the material, and the end or goal, the good, for the sake of which the agent puts the form into the material. The causality of the other causes depends on the causality of the good, since the material and form can only be causes when the agent joins them, and the agent can only act if he has some reason for acting, which is given by the good he is trying to achieve. The good is thus primary, the most causal of all causes, since it moves everything else but is itself unmoved. The good is the object of desire and choice. It is that for the sake of which every movement and change takes place. The unmoved mover that Aristotle finds in Metaphysics 12 is therefore also good. And this is quote 12 on the handout. The final cause then produces motion as being loved, but all other things move by being moved. Now if something is moved, it is capable of being otherwise than as it is. But since there is something which moves while itself unmoved, existing actually, this can in no way be otherwise than it is. The first mover then exists of necessity, and insofar as it exists by necessity, its mode of being is good. And it is, in this sense, a first principle, a first beginning. The first and most universal cause, therefore, is the good. And here, <clears throat> Aristotle's argument converges with that of Socrates in Republic 6 through 7. But while Socrates arrives at the form of the good as being something that is both a universal predicate and a universal cause, Aristotle arrives at a good which is only a universal cause, but not a universal predicate. This good is not said of other things. This good, Aristotle argues, is a living, thinking being. He calls it the God, ho theos. And this is quote 13, the final quote. If then... God, ho theos, is always in that good state in which we sometimes are. This compels our wonder. And if in a better, this compels it yet more. And God is in a better state. And life also belongs to God, for the actuality of thought is life, and God is that actuality. And God's self-dependent actuality is life most good and eternal. We say, therefore, that God is a living being 
eternal, most good, so that life and duration, continuous and eternal, belong to God, for this is God. This compels our wonder, he says. This is the wonder at the universal cause and source of all being, perfection, and goodness. And this is, for me, why the philosophical life is worth living because of this wonder. Max Weber calls people who have this wonder overgrown children. But uh, <laughs> when it comes to the search for that amechanon kalos, that overwhelming beauty, as Glaucon calls it, I am content to be a child.